Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Dr. Vidal for the introduction. And before I begin, I want also to talk uh, to thank uh, Verasite for inviting me today to give this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the development and validation of uh, genomic signatures, the, the main ones, in uh, early breast cancer. So um, as we know, uh, over the time, many uh, genomic biomarkers have been developed uh, to, prognostic, to predict prognosis in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative early breast cancer. Uh, each one is different from another, from the others. But anyway, the most important thing, uh, thing that we need to look at when choosing the right test for the right patient is first of all, the level of evidence and mama print. Oncotype DX, PAM50, and Endopredict are the four main uh, genomic biomarkers who have reached at least 111B evidence for uh, luminal early breast cancer. In particular, MamaPrint and Oncotype DX have been validated uh, from prospective clinical trials. They were specifically designed to test the biomarker validity. And for this reason, they reached a level 1A evidence, whereas PAM50 or Prosigna and Endopredict uh, were tested, were validated retrospectively in at least two uh, randomized clinical trials that were designed with other objectives. And for this reason, they for now reached the 11-1B evidence. Anyway, all these um, biomarkers has, have reached the 11 one uh, I mean, the highest level of evidence. Other important issue is that we need to take into account when uh, evaluating the different uh, um, genomic biomarkers is the uh, type of samples that need to be used to uh, perform the genomic assay and the genomic pl platform that each of these uh, genomic biomarkers use to uh, estimate the risk of recurrence. Uh, for example, MAMA print uh, back in the days uh, uh, needed, needed, needed to be performed in fresh frozen tumor samples. This was a, tech, this was, uh, a practical limitation. Um, now it is also feasible uh, through NGS in uh, uh, archival tumor tissues, at least in Europe for now. Uh, but anyway, for example, also the uh, genomic platforms uh, did, did might seem to you uh, only uh, a technical issue, but, um, but in fact, uh, the type of genomic platform used and technology used for RNA sequencing affects whether uh, the test could be run uh, in a local laboratory or in a central laboratory. And this, uh, in your clinical practice, uh, is going to affect the timing. You, you need to wait to get the, the results for your patient and also the workload of your pathology department. And uh, last but not least, uh, the statistical uh, um, development and the training data sets uh, of, uh, um, that were used to train these genomic biomarkers really matters because they might affect the performance of each of these uh, genomic scores in a particular patient sub uh, subtype, uh, subpopulation that might have been underrepresented in the uh, former database that were used to develop uh, the algorithm. And another important uh, aspect that we need to take into account is whether the algorithm for the calculation of the risk score already included uh, the uh, tumor size and nodal status. I mean, the uh, clinical prognostic factors, because this is going to affect the way we need to interpret the uh, output of the genomic risk score. So uh, let's mm, drive, uh, dive a little more uh, in depth of the development of these genomic assays. Let's start with the MAPMA print signature. Uh, basically, this signature was developed in uh, a training data set of 78 patients. Uh, uh, those patients were all not negative. And the, the investigators started to select uh, putative <coughs> prognostic genes from a large microarray uh, data sets of more than 2,000 genes. And they applied the unsupervised hierarchical, hierarchical clusteries, uh, clustering, which means they applied a statistical method that allows to classify uh, tumor samples based on differences and similarities in gene expression. Uh, 
the analysis was unsupervised. That means that uh, the investigator did not get to set a priori the criteria for the clustering, but the algorithm is, uh, itself uh, established the criteria. So uh, starting from the selected 5,000 genes, they then uh, selected, shrunk down the number of uh, uh, prognostic genes by uh, uh, supervised selection this time. So they picked the genes that uh, uh, showed a significant uh, correlation with a better or worse prognosis. And then they were left with seven genes that now uh, are included in the MAMA print signature. The main validation of the uh, MAMA print uh, signature uh, has, been, uh, has been done uh, through a prospective randomized trial, the MINDACT uh, study. Basically, uh, this trial enrolled uh, almost 7,000 patients uh, with any immunostochemical breast cancer subtype, triple negative or two positive luminal, and any nodal status. And, uh, this, uh, the MAMA print is a first generation uh, genomic test, so does not include in uh, its algorithm the tumor size and nodal status. So patients were classified according to clinical risk group and the MAMA print genomic risk group. And the clinical risk group was defined based on the adjuvant uh, online tool. So basically, uh, patients falling in the clinical low, genomic low risk category were uh, uh, allocated to endocrine therapy alone, whereas um, patients with concordant clinical, uh, clinical high, genomic high risk group were allocated to chemoendocrine therapy, whereas the discordant group, I mean, the patient with the clinically high genomic low or genomic high clinical low uh, group were randomized to either receive or not receive adjuvant chemotherapy. Be aware that here, the primary endpoint was the distant metastasis free survival at five years in patient falling in the clinical high genomic low group that did not receive chemotherapy. And the trial was to be considered positive if the lower confidence interval for distant disease free survival was up to 92%. So they set the non inferiority threshold to 92% distant disease free survival. As you can see from this Kaplan-Meier, the uh, primary endpoint was clearly met. At five years, the distant uh, metastasis-free survival in this group, so clinically high, genomic low group that did not receive chemotherapy, was almost 95%, and the lower boundary was above 92%. And the results were maintained uh, at a larger follow-up of almost nine years. But what about the clinical risk? I mean. We know that this test does not include in the algorithm the tumor size and nodal status. So the main question here is, does the clinical risk still matter when we take to account uh, uh, the genomic risk? The answer is yes, as you can see. This is a secondary analysis from the MINDACT, where um, those are the kaplan meyers according to the matched genomic and uh, uh, clinical risk group. And within the same genomic risk category, the clinical risk still discriminates groups at different prognoses with about a 5% absolute difference in distant uh, recurrence at nine years. Another important issue is the chemotherapy benefit in the clinical high genomic low uh, group in younger patients. This is an issue that we are also going to observe with the Oncotype DX uh, uh, genomic test. As you can see, in, young, in younger patients, um, there is still a significant clinic, clinically significant benefit of adding adjuvant chemotherapy, even though these patients have a genomic low risk with a 5% absolute different, uh, difference in nine years. So let's uh, skip to Oncotype DX development. Uh, at the beginning, uh, Oncotype DX uh, was meant to overcome the technical limitation of performing uh, RNA sequencing from fresh tumor samples. So the investigator developed and validated a method to extract RNA from archival tumor samples. They basically selected five housekeeping genes that are the five different genes that nowadays are included in the Oncotype DX genomic score. And uh, they used the normalization of the, uh, the gene expression of the other genes based on those housekeeping genes. 
And after they uh, developed and uh, validated analytically uh, this method, uh, they developed the Oncotype DX score. And I think that uh, the um, history of the development of Oncotype DX is quite interesting because unlike MamaPrint, Prosimia, and Endopredict, the, statistical, uh, the, statics, the statistics behind the development of the Oncotype DX is quite simple. It was hypothesis driven. The investigator just picked 250 genes that were already published and known to be uh, associated with breast cancer prognosis. So it was just by choice uh, without machine learn any machine learning algorithm. And then they tested with the simple univariate Cox survival analysis those genes in three different patient cohorts that represented different uh, pro patient prognostic subpopulation. Uh, we incl they included a cohort with uh, any nodal status and uh, patients who received chemoendocrine therapy. They, uh, the RASH uh, center cohort included patients with extremely high clinical risk breast cancer with more than 10 positive nodes. And they the NSABP trial that included only luminal patient, not negative, treated with uh, tamoxifen endocrine therapy alone. And then they kept the uh, genes that remained significant across the three data sets and derived the oncotype risk score. So they were left with 16 breast cancer related genes plus the five uh, housekeeping reference genes that were developed before. So Oncotype has been validated uh, across, uh, uh, retrospectively across uh, several uh, already published clinical trials, but I think that the main uh, information about this test comes from the two prognostic randomized trials used to validate the biomarker. Uh, I'm talking about the TaylorX and the uh, Rx Ponder. The TaylorX was the trial that validated the Oncotype in the not negative luminal patient. Basically, uh, almost uh, uh, more than 10,000 patients were enrolled and tested for oncotype DX. And uh, the one falling in the low genomic group with a recurrence score below 11 were allocated to endocrine therapy alone. The one fall with a recurrence score above 25 were uh, deemed high risk and were allocated to chemoendocrine therapy, whereas the, the one falling in the intermediate risk score were randomized to either receive or not uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. The primary endpoint uh, was clearly met also in this study. Uh, as you can see, no significant, differ significant difference uh, could be observed uh, between the chemoendocrine therapy and endocrine therapy arm in the intermediate risk score group. <laughs> However, if we look closer to uh, the young patient population, patient 50 years or younger, we can see that uh, we still can observe an absolute uh, benefit of adding adjuvant chemotherapy. And this benefit increases as we increase the risk of recurrence. And uh, the absolute benefit is about 7%, so a, clinical, a clinically significant difference in patients with a recurrence score between 21 and 25. And what about uh, the role of clinical risk here? As MAMA print, Oncotype DX is a... Um, First, uh, uh, first generation uh, genomic test. So it did not include clinical variables uh, in the uh, algorithm calculated the risk, the risk of relapse score. And as you can see, uh, like we observed with the MAMA print essay, here the clinical risk still matter. So within the same genomic uh, risk category, the uh, clinical risk still discriminates patient uh, with different prognosis. And this holds true for older patients, older than 50 years, and for younger patients. The Responder is the other prospective trial that validated Oncotype DX in node positive patients, basically in, uh, fifth, more than 5,000 patients with up to three positive nodes were included in this trial, tested for Oncotype DX, and if they fall in the uh, risk score above 25, they were uh, um, allocated to adjuvant chemotherapy, whereas they had a risk of recurrence between 0 and 25, they were randomized to either receive chemotherapy or not. The primary endpoint was met too. No difference was observable between the chemotherapy and endocrine therapy in only uh, arm in the uh, patient with a risk score below 25. Anyway, 
even in this trial, is we look closer at the premenopausal and the uh, younger patient with five years uh, or younger, we can see that there is an absolute benefit of adding chemotherapy in this patient subpopulation. And uh, in this case, in not patient, uh, positive patient, this benefit is consistent independently of the uh, level of uh, uh, recurrence score. I mean, also patient with a really low recurrence score between zero and, t and 10, uh, strongly benefit from the addition of adjuvant chemotherapy. So now le uh, let's start talking about the second generation genomic biomarkers. Um, first, I'll, I'll start with the EndoPredict. Uh, EndoPredict was developed uh, from a training data sets which was more homogeneous compared to the other genomic biomarkers because all patients who had hormone receptor positive or two negative and were treated homogeneously with adjuvant tamoxifen. And the statistical design uh, for the development of the endopredictory score is quite complex, but basically the main steps were the supervised hierarchical, hierarchical clustering that allowed to uh, uh, classify and select from more than 20,000 genes 104 candidate pro, uh, prognostic genes. Uh, this time, unlike the MAMA print uh, development, the analysis was supervised. That means that the investigator set the criteria for classification. The criteria was the risk of relapse and the clinical variables. Then they developed uh, uh, an algorithm to uh, transfer the platform that were micro -range in expression at the beginning to uh, RNA sequencing based on uh, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR. And then they trained the final algorithm using a cross-validation uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm that left with eight genes that are the genes including the endopredict signature plus the clinical variables that derived the risk score uh, um, of the epiclean. Then the, uh, the technology uh, to derive the EpiClean score was validated for local testing. And then uh, the EpiClean was mainly validated in these uh, two randomized trials, the ABCG68 that are two pooled randomized trials and from in the ATAC randomized trial. Uh, both trials include hormone receptor positive R2 negative patient uh, treated with adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. These uh, you are observing on the results for NAD negative uh, patient, as you can see. The endopredict uh, classifies patient in two risk categories a low risk and a high risk. And as you can see, in both trial, uh, endopredict is significantly prognostic. And moreover, patient falling in the low risk category shows a 10 year uh, distant relapse uh, rate that is far below 10%. The same validation has been performed for not positive patient. Uh, of course, number of patients are smaller here. Basically, uh, it was validated uh, across the same trials, the ABCG68 and the ATAC, uh, because in, uh, this trial included also a not positive patient. And as you can see, also in the not positive subpopulation, the endopredict is strongly prognostic. And importantly, the low risk group still identifies patient with a le uh, less than 10% distant relapse uh, uh, rate at 10 years, even if they are not positive. But also remember that his algorithm already included the nodal status in the uh, algorithm for the uh, risk call calculation. The, uh, for not positive patient, the EpiClean was also validated in a Spanish study, the JCAM 9606 randomized trial. This trial included patient extremely high risk with uh, uh, up to 10 positive lymph nodes that were randomized to two different uh, schemes of adjuvant chemotherapy. And even in this high risk population, you can see that the low risk of the EpiClean score identified patient with only a 7% distant relapse rate at uh, 10 years. So now I'm going to uh, tol uh, talk about briefly about the development of Prosinia because then uh, Dr. Pasquale is going to explain this in detail. Uh, but I think that the development of, of uh, PAM50 is quite interesting because it's quite different uh, uh, from the other genomic biomarkers. Uh, here, uh, two training data sets were used, one for the subtype, the interesting subtype prediction, and one to develop the risk of recurrence score. 
The uh, training data set for the subtype prediction included patients with any immunohistochemically breast cancer subtype, any nodal status, and any type of, of adjuvant treatment, plus 29 normal breast cancer samples that were the prototype for the normal-like subtype. Whereas the RT development uh, was performed on a uh, data set of node-negative untreated breast cancer patients and immunohistochemical su uh, subtype, and a machine learning algorithm was applied, in particular the ridge regression. Then both algorithms, the one for subtype prediction and the one for ROR calculation, were tested in the same data sets in, uh, of uh, more than 700 patients. Uh, these data sets included any subtype of breast cancer, triple negative or two positive and luminal, but all patients were uh, not negative and untreated. And as you can see, both intrinsic subtype and the risk of recurrence were uh, independently uh, strongly associated with prognosis. And if you look at the panel in the middle, um, in the uh, luminal breast cancer immunohistochemical subtypes, so hormone receptor positive R2 negative patient, all intrin intrinsic subtypes are recapitulated and intrinsic subtypes are significantly prognostic uh, in this patient subgroup. A further validation has been performed in another uh, test data sets, uh, including uh, about 130 patients uh, treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this further validation uh, was performed to um, test the predictive uh, role of subtypes uh, and ROR. So if these, uh, 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 if both interest in subtype and risk of recurrence could predict benefit from, from chemotherapy in terms of PCR. And as you can see from these results, both intrinsic subtype and risk of recurrence uh, were able to significantly predict the benefit from uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in terms of pathologic complete response. As Dr. Ridal has, show, uh, has, uh, has shown before, uh, Prosenia has been extensively validated uh, in several cohorts of patients, but those are the three main court validation court, the ATAC randomized trial, the ABCGA randomized trial, and a Danish prospective court uh, with more than 1,000 patients. Uh, those are the results for non-negative or more receptor positive or two negative patients treated all with adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. Unlike endopredict, Prosigna identifies three risk score category, a low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk uh, category. And as you can see, uh, it is significantly prognostic uh, uh, across the three data sets. The uh, patient falling in the low risk category in the three data sets show a uh, risk of recur distal recurrence at 10 years below 10%. Patient falling in the high risk category has uh, have an a significantly high risk of recurrence and therefore they should be endorsed for adjuvant chemotherapy. What about patient in the intermediate uh, risk score that show uh, risk of recurrence uh, between 10 and 20%? Before, let's see uh, how uh, performs Prosigna in odd positive patient. Those are the data uh, in the same prospective cohort, but in odd positive patient. And as you can see, Prosigna remains prognostic also uh, in not positive patient. Of course, patients fall in the low risk category are fewer, but uh, they have an extremely good prognosis, even though they are not positive. And remember that also Prosigna includes the nodal status uh, and uh, the tumor sites uh, in the risk score calculation. And what about intermediate risk score? Well, what you need to keep in mind is that unlike the other genomic biomarkers, Prosigna gives us two types of information, the risk of recurrence, but also the biology of the tumor, so the, intrin the intrinsic subtype. And in the panel above, you can see uh, the distribution of intrinsic subtypes according to risk of recurrence. As you can see, all luminal A patient fall in the low risk, in the uh, ROR low category, and no zero luminal A patient fall in the high risk row. But when you look at the intermediate, inter intermediate row, you can, um, ROR, you can observe a significant, uh, an important overlap between uh, luminal A and luminal B subtypes. And remember that intrinsic subtypes, in particular luminal B versus luminal A, are significantly prognostic by themselves. So luminal B breast cancer, 
independently of risk of recurrence, have a poorer prognosis compared to luminal A subtypes. And as you can see uh, from the previous presentation, uh, intrinsic subtypes have been extensively validated also as a predictive biomarkers of benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, if you can look at the, this table below, this is one of the many va uh, validation the neoadjuvant sectin performed by professional, uh, Professor Aleish Pratt. As you can see, luminal B significantly benefit more than luminal A from adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in terms of PCR. So luminal B and luminal A subtypes are prognostic and predictive of chemotherapy benefits. So these subtypes need to be taken into account when we have patients falling in the intermediate row uh, category. So concluding, uh, genomic assays have proven uh, have proven to have a clinical, significant clinical utility in hormoreceptor positive ER2 negative breast cancer, both in node negative and node positive disease, up to three positive nodes. However, the way uh, these genomic uh, biomarkers were validated, developed, uh, and the type of genomic, pl genomic platform were used affects the, how we are going to use them in clinical practice and uh, how they perform in specific uh, um, subtypes uh, of patients with breast cancer. With ge first generation genomic assays, so MAMA print and Ocotype DX, the clinical risk must be taken into account when we need to take uh, choices whether uh, prescribe adjuvant chemotherapy or not. It, it appears that second generation genomic assays like Endopredict and Prosenia partially overcome uh, this problem by including the nodal status of tumor size in the algorithm calculating the uh, risk of recurrence. We still have a few data uh, on premenopausal patient based on current evidence, young patient younger than 50 years should receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy if not positive, no matter what, according to the oncotype results. And uh, well, uh, in a careful evaluation should be uh, taken uh, whether they are not negative. So more data are needed, especially with second generation genomic assays and prosenia in, in this subset, uh, and this will be really helpful uh, for uh, clinical oncologists. Thank you for your attention.